Welcome back to another episode of Wicked. Mysterious. I'm your host, Danny. And I'm fucking Katie. <laughs> and this is season two, episode two. So cool. Are we ready for something different? Yeah. Fuck okay. yeah. It was meant to be different? I'm in a swearing mood today. Okay, that's all right. Sometimes sometimes it really do be like that. It do be. Um, so this was meant to be something different, but ended up unintentionally tying together with other episodes that we've done, as always. Oh. Um, also, I read a whole book for this, by the way. Fuck, that's great. <laughs> I was just going to swear again. What so is wrong with me? My head is going to be huge by the time we're done with this podcast with I all these books that. I read yeah. for you, our listeners. It's so good. All right. So uh, I've got nothing new to add to you. Any housekeeping? Housekeeping. Um, housekeeping. Housekeeping. Um, let's just say check out our merch on Etsy, Wicked Mysterious Co., Check us out on Facebook. And We're going to be better about posting more things. I think I'm going to start posting photos of Lala. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just That'll because. get their attention. It will. Yeah. She's a beautiful, round lady. She is. She looks like a loaf of bread. And um, um, also, I should have mentioned this in the last episode, but those who didn't see our live, they can go back if they want to see what I look like. <laughs> So go check it out. It's on Facebook. Yes, it is on Facebook. And leave us some love while you're there, you know? So just give it a little heart or something. That would be nice. That'd be also, cool. please subscribe to us on YouTube, please. Yeah, please. I would really love that. And Instagram, if you've got that, that would be great. For some reason, our Facebook blew up, but Instagram is like, nah. Yeah. Not the, interested. Do the TikToks go to Instagram? Yep. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So Facebook is just way more lively. I guess. For this kind of shit, maybe. Well, Facebook was competing with TikTok, so we just oh. happened to hit the algorithm, right? You did. I did. Nailed it. Thanks. So All right. I'm excited about this. This is a full length, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is a full length episode, yes. Yes. I wonder if you've heard of it. I'm so excited. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One morning. Already fucked up. <laughs> One morning. <laughs> okay. At three o'clock one morning in 1975, Ingo Swan was awoken by the sound of his phone ringing. Groggy, he begrudgingly got out of bed. Hello? He answered. Ingo, the voice said. We would, <laughs> we would like to enlist your help. Having recently discussed with a friend the potential of being scouted by the government, Ingo reluctantly said yes. The voice said, you cannot tell anyone you're leaving. Do you agree? Yes, Ingo agreed. Cool. The voice asked, are you familiar with the Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C.? He did know the museum, having enjoyed looking at the museum's vast collection of crystals and minerals. Ooh. Stand by the elephant on the main floor of the museum at noon and wait for instructions, he was told. But how will I know what you look like, Ingo asked. You don't need to. We already know what you look like, the voice responded. And with that, Ingo heard the phone disconnect. Ooh. The next day, Ingo stood by the elephant at the designated time, sweating profusely. A military-looking official arrived right on time, handing Ingo a card that read, Do not speak or ask questions. This is for our safety as well as yours. Please follow me. Ingo followed the man to a waiting car, where inside was another man who looked almost identical to the first man, leading Ingo to refer to them as the twins. The second man gave Ingo a card that read, Please do not speak. We need to check you for listening devices. At which point he was searched, which included one of the twins peering into his shorts. What? The last card he was handed said, We would like your help on a project suited to your talent. Are you comfortable in a helicopter? Wait, did that question come after looking in the shorts? Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with anything uh -oh. in the shorts. Okay. <laughs> a bag was put over Ingo's head, and he felt the car drive around in circles before he was taken to a helicopter and then led through a building and down an elevator. What? This is the strange and true story of Ingo Swan, the man who helped the CIA remote view the dark side of the moon. What? Let's get into it. I have 
goosebumps. Yay. Because I didn't expect that. I know. I really didn't. Okay. I'm excited. All right. Ingo was born on September 14th so in weird. 1933 in Tell- Telluride, Colorado. The following quote is from a document released on the CIA, CIA website by FOIA. And if you don't know, FOIA is the Freedom of Information Act, and that's where you can get a lot of information on black ops shit. Okay, so here's the quote. When Ingo Swan was a small child, he would sometimes float from his bed at night, soaring out of his body and slipping into the earth of his native Rocky Mountains, where he would follow the veins of metal ore through the ground until they emerged on the mountain surface. A childhood fantasy? Perhaps. But consider the many today still floating, only this time at the direction of Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park. Again and again, Swan has demonstrated his ability to see a distant object without leaving his body. Dr. Harold Puthoff and Russell Targ, physicists at Stanford Research Institute, or SRI, call this phenomenon remote viewing. Swan calls it out-of-body experience, or U- I keep doing that, U-U-B-E, but no, it's O-O-B-E. Swan's O-O-B-E began in the most common manner in a stress situation. The classic UUBE happens spontaneously during an accident or a surgical operation. The individual, generally after being terrified by the prospect of death, is amazed to find himself hovering above his own body, watching the surrounding activity with a new detachment. Ingo Swan experienced this phenomenon when he was three years old during a tonsillectomy. Gliding up above his small body, the child watched with fascination as the doctor performed the operation. What, did he flatline? No. He's just doing this without dying? Yes. Okay. Hearing the doctor say a forbidden word as his knife slipped brought a sense of shocked pleasure to the small voyeur. Then Ingo Swan says that he looked down at his own open mouth and saw blood oozing from the accidental wound. He noted with interest that the doctor placed the tonsils behind two rolls of paper and a side cabinet. When I awakened from the anesthetic, I began to cry because my throat had been cut, though I couldn't possibly feel it because everything was numb. The doctor couldn't understand how I knew. Then I had asked him for my tonsils. A souvenir was the very least he could do, I thought, but he insisted that he'd thrown them away. I wouldn't let him get away with that. No, you didn't, I contradicted him. You put them over there behind those things. Uh huh. This is on the CIA website. I saw it. Wow. I believe this shit. Yeah, absolutely. This is out of body shit. Yeah. Okay, so Anko's family quickly learned of his gifts. At a party one night, a photographer was taking pictures of people to supposedly indicate if they had psychic powers. This kind of reminds me of taking an aura photo. Mm-hmm. Have you ever done that? No, but I've heard about it. I have one upstairs. Wow. I had one taken of me and my son when he was a baby. I'll show you and I'll post it too. Cool. Um, it's cool because like it's like bluish purple so, around and me. And that's good, right? Um, like, I don't know. Yeah, and, cool. And there's like a golden beam coming out of his head. I need to see that. I'll show you. If you remind me. Yeah. Anyway, Ingo's photo was the only one that showed a ball of light floating above his head. Mm -hmm. Interesting. He volunteered for ESP research projects, many of which were held at the American Society for Psychical Research starting in the 1970s. Under the direction of Dr. Gertrude Schmeidler, Ingo was tested for psychokinetic abilities, also called PK abilities which is the movement of an object by using focused attention. Now, Dr. Schmeidler was well known for other ESP testing before Ingo, such as a previous study called the sheep goat experiment. Hmm. Two groups of people, the sheeps and the goats they were labeled, were tested for ESP skills. I'm sorry, the first group called the sheep believed in ESP, and the other group, the goats, did not believe in ESP. They used Zener cards. Have you seen those before? No. Okay. Um, they're very they're a very popular tool used to test psychic powers, created in the 1930s by psychologist Carl Zener. Hmm. You, I bet if you saw if them, saw you would them, know what yeah, they were. Um, yeah. I just when I think of cards, I just think of like tarot cards. But no, I no. They're um. Should I just Google it? 
Yeah, but uh, so psychic testing uses this deck. It's 25 cards, and each card has a symbol, Mm -hmm. which could be a plus sign, squiggly lines, a circle, a star, or a square. Okay. There are five of each card in the deck. Okay. The person being tested guesses which card will come up, so the test is done 25 times. Yeah. Once for each card in the deck. Okay. In the sheep goat study by Dr. Schmeidler, those who believed in ESP scored higher on the Zener card test than those who did not. Mm. This test was successfully replicated by other researchers. Interesting. So I just want to say here, anywhere you look into remote viewing, it always, always says that it's a pseudoscience and that there is no scientific evidence to back it up. That is complete bullshit. Bullshit. There's, there is multiple replica, replicable studies because that's, what's important is that you have to be able to replicate it from researcher to researcher. It's part of the like scientific method. They did follow the scientific method and this was proven, but again, for some reason, it's it's just not accepted. It's always pseudoscience. Yeah. Yeah. It's just easier to say that. Yeah. So most of these tests that Dr. Schmeidler used on Ingo Swan were related to temperature, and Ingo was tested to see if he could change the temperature around an object some distance away from him. The thermometer was often placed in a thermos, and Ingo was instructed to change the temperature back and forth between hot and cold, which he was successful at. Ingo referred to his ability as psychic probes, and he was able to make recordable changes to graphite, random number generators, and supposedly his own blood cells. Using electrophysiological recording devices connected to large copper pipes, researchers were able to record energy emanating from Ingo's body. What? Yeah. Wow. Wow. I can't believe I've never heard of this guy. Ever. Weird, right? Wow. Wow. It gets crazier. Yeah. Okay. Also, at the, at the same place, the American Society for Psychical Research, Ingo was studied while practicing his out-of-body experiences. Researchers noted that his brain waves during these times were in an alpha state. Some of our listeners might remember the alpha state from our Helen Hadsel episode. So if this is your first time listening, I am so sorry to people who have heard me say this thousands of times, but Helen won over 5,000 contests throughout her life by visualizing, um, using a visualization technique that uses the alpha state. Helen had trained under Jose Silva, who created the Silva method, which is a training program to switch the brain into the alpha state. So the alpha state is a brain state of relaxation where the mind is calm, but alert. The alpha state is where the brain the alpha state is where the brain is when transitioning to and from sleep or during daydreaming. Mm. This is not to be confused with the theta state, which is the state the brain is in during meditation. Okay. However, there are some great Silva method meditations on YouTube if anybody's interested in learning how Helen visualized winning all those contests. Um, but in the non-woo-woo, new age sense, alpha is the state that your brain is in when you're able to relax and focus when you're working on a project. The alpha state is when you're in flow. So it's when you're not like easily distracted, but you're not stressed about what you're doing either. Yep. You're just like yep. working. Yep. Um, Interesting. During his out-of-body experiences, Ingo was able to describe things he could not see, such as objects placed in a different room or in sealed boxes. In one experiment, Ingo failed miserably, only to have the researchers later realize he was predicting the next image in the box, rather than the one currently being showed to him. When this was explained to Ingo, his results drastically improved. Wow. So he was like, he was, he was imagining the next, Mm -hmm. not the one that they were. He was seeing it. He was seeing the next one. Also, I don't think I wrote it down, but he keeps his eyes open during this whole thing. So cool. Isn't that crazy? Oh, I love it. Um, so cool. It's kind of like off topic real quick, but sure. like those twins that have you ever seen them like with a, with a wall in between them and they'll, the, the parents will be like one, two, three, and they'll hold up something at the same time. And like the parent, the twins will often choose the same twin object. telepathy. Yeah. I didn't get into that in oh, this. This so is cool. mostly about remote viewing. Yeah. Yeah. But- yeah. yeah. He does talk a lot about telepathy, which so you still can do an episode on it if you want. 
it's would probably be completely different yeah. because this is very specific to him and his work. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So speaking cool. of that, the story I was going to tell you before when we talked about telepathy. So my dad and my uncle shared a room when they were kids. They had twin beds yeah. like across from each other. And my uncle would make my dad stay up all night because my dad could read his mind. And my uncle would pick a card, uh-huh. like a suit uh-huh. and a number yep. in his head. And my dad would guess it over and over and over again. And it would freak my uncle out so bad that my uncle would like make my dad stay up late doing it all night. And my dad told me how he does it. And I've never been able to, wow. to do it like he could. Super um, cool. He said he would like imagine a deck of cards in his head and whatever one my uncle was thinking of would light up pizza, he wow. said. Um, that my, is so cool. Yeah. And my dad told me when I was a kid, if uh-huh. you have gifts like that, mm-hmm. use them because if you don't, you will lose them right. like he did. Mm-hmm. So whoever's out there, this is your sign yep, to use you your have, gifts. Yes. Use your gift. But isn't that cool? So cool. Okay. So during- I can't imagine things like- physically in my mind i can't so like i I know a lot of people can but i have a hard time like actually seeing something in my mind i have no problem visualizing the things that i want like i can visualize like the money that i want in my bank account i can visual like i did practice with the helen hansel stuff with something small and i did i did get it yeah but i can't visualize something in my head and then draw it i can visualize i like I can't. It's more like Is something I, broken up. There? No, no. There's there are like uh, there, it's called something. Yeah. I can't. I can't visualize something in my head to be able to draw it. Right. I can copy a picture, uh-huh. but I can't see something in my head and draw. It. Like so, yeah. for me, the deck of cards is more like an i an idea. I don't know how else to describe it. It's hmm. not like a picture. Yeah. I don't know. So interesting. But I'm the same. How are all different? Yeah. But you have artistic skills. So I do, I don't, but. I don't, I also don't draw from mind. Really? I draw from what I see. Really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I wish I could draw from my mind because I would love to have that capability of oh, like yeah. just expression. Being flow, like, yeah. Yes. But it's I don't the best have part that. of art when I you don't can have just, that. Yeah. Okay. So during his out of body experiences, Ingo was not only able to see, but he was able to hear. So to test this, researchers played decoy sounds, such as a bird chirping, for example, in the room with Ingo. In another room, they'd play the a different room noise. The room or the room? Room. The room or room. the room? Room. In the other room. room. In the other room. <laughs> they'd play a different noise, such as music playing. The trials concluded with Ingo's success, despite the odds being 64 to 1. Wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Are you kidding? No. Holy shit. Yeah. Every time he won, he, every time he was right with the odds being 6 to 4 to 1. Um I think they only did a couple trials twice. of this. Yeah. I think it was twice. I don't know why they wouldn't do it more because yeah. you would think that's such an easy experiment, but I didn't get the exact number of how many times they did it. Wow. Um that's only that still, like, Yeah. Wow. And he wasn't always 100% accurate. There are some things that he was wrong about because the way that they research it is like, I feel like the other half has to be just as good as you. If it's like, so for like example, his brother or your father's brother, like he would have to be in no, no nope. focusing hard enough. Nope. No, it's nothing to do with focus. It wow. has to do with the other person accessing the information. Huh? I mean, you might have to hold the image in your head, right, but it's right. not like, like you're what like, if you were oh, like trying to send it. What if it? you were like wicked half ass? Like you were like, Katie, think of a number. And I was just like. Two fucking, and then I thought of something else, but I wasn't like two, 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 two. No, in my you head. don't need to be. I like always that. wondered if you had to be like that when you were trying to. Send yeah, it. I used to I think did that with the scarlet. Yeah, with the name thing, like you like talked about over and over and over episode. and over. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. And he even says that um, he, Ingo Swan was quoted as saying that if telepathy works the way that we think it does, or the way the research has shown that it does, yeah. you don't even need to be anywhere near the person. Right, and he even That's- says. That when he worked for the CIA, people would not have lunch with him and he'd have to eat alone because they knew that he could read their mind Mm -hmm. and that they didn't want him to 
access like government secrets it doesn't seem Wild. like he ever did do that because yeah. we'll get into it he was like a genuinely good person and good. was yeah. loved by a lot of people and i don't think he would have done that but yeah they had secrets and they didn't want wow. they didn't want him to know that's so um, nuts to think about like reading someone's mind that's not even around you know yeah yeah so later ingo worked with renowned oh you're gonna love this so he worked with renowned polygrapher Cleve Baxter. Okay. The team connected live plant leaves to a polygraph. And using his imagination, Ingo visualized different ways of harming the plant. The polygraph would pick up stress signals from the plant, leading researchers to believe that plants are actually conscious. Oh, dude, I just, just learned about this. That plants can actually see you. Like, yeah, they don't have eyeballs, but they can actually make out like you're there, like your shadow. And there is a consciousness like with col- like certain colors and stuff, which is amazing if you think about that. I had written down to cover for a mini something I, I saw on TikTok that was plants are sentient. But when I looked it up, I could find nothing at huh. all. It's hard because you have to really know where to look. Like if I had known this, I might have been able to dig into it further. But Googling our plant sentient leads you like nowhere. Mm. Um, so I believe it. Um, yeah. Because I mean, there's so much evidence of just people that love plants that they say when they talk to their plants. I wrote that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, so cool. Um, so the polygraph would pick up stress signals from the plant, That's leading researchers to believe that the wild. plants are actually con- conscious. My next sentence is, this is why talking to plants probably makes them grow. Wow. Interestingly, if Ingo repeated the same visualization, the plant stress would slowly decrease with every time he did it. Because it's like, so like it's as like, if they were learning uh-huh. that it wasn't an actual threat. Wow. Introduction of a new visualization, though, that would harm the plant would start the stress signals all over again. That is so fascinating. So, um, wow. For some of the things that he would think about would be like lighting it on fire, pouring acid on its leaves, Uh like stuff like that. Crazy, right? Right. And eventually it was like, you're all talk, motherfucker. I'm not scared of you. And then eventually it... it, it, But then it's like, whoa, what's this acid? This is... is, We weren't talking about acid, bro. Yeah. That's funny. (laughs) Oh, man. Right? Isn't this insane? Yeah. Okay. Then Ingo was invited to work with the Stanford Research Institute on their remote viewing project. Before his work began, Ingo was tested extensively by the Institute using a quark detector. This detector was encased in concrete and completely inaccessible. So this quark detection stuff is one of those super confusing quantum physics things. But a quark is an elementary particle which help make up protons and neutrons in an atom. So they're like the smallest part of an atom. They cannot be broken down into further compartments. So I think if I understand this correctly, a quark detector actually detects the interactions between quarks. And Ingo was able to use his mind alone to create these interactions. He was also able to start and stop them on his own, um, and it was picked up by the quark detector, and they have no explanation other than he was doing it. That's fucking wild. But yeah, it's pseudoscience. Jesus. Yeah, okay. pseudoscience. Come on. It's a fucking gift. Like, our brains, we know we do not use all of our brains, and some some of us use more than others. We fucking know that. So we'll get into how his brain was a little... Different. Different. Cool. But um, in like that, yeah. 1973, with the Stanford Research Institute, Ingo and the researchers devised a plan to send his consciousness to view Jupiter. He did so with incredible success and described something that no one would have guessed was there, a ring around Jupiter. What? This was previously unknown to science. And you know, again, to bring it full circle, Always. what saw that ring around Jupiter was the Voyager 1 probe that we talked about in the Golden Record episode. The Uh, Golden Record was on the Voyager 1, which passed by Jupiter. And Ingo Swan saw that that six years before. What? So six years before. This is nuts that everything mysterious is connected. Yeah, I know. (laughs) So Ingo Swan 
six years, but it was in 1973. He did this remote viewing project, saw that um, there was um, a ring around Jupiter amongst other things like crystals, um, different colors of things. Um, I, th- he didn't get them all right though. Mm-hmm. Um, but more, I think it was like 60% accuracy. Wow. Um, but keep in mind that 60% accuracy is way higher than everybody else. They oh, tested way yeah. higher by like a lot. Oh Yeah. The Voyager 1 probe that carried the golden record that we did an episode on proved Ingo's projection to be correct when it passed Jupiter in 1979. Wow. Ingo took part in the development of a remote viewing training program, which was later adopted by the military. This program was tested extensively. One interesting thing that I kept coming across was that remote viewing and ESP and basically anything psychic is still, oh, I, I said that already, still viewed as pseudoscience, pseudoscience despite hard scientific evidence and successful replication of studies. Ingo is often called the father of remote viewing, but his role was more about being able to prove this using science. Um, so a lot of times, like when he's interviewed, he's very rarely interviewed, but I listened to all the ones that I could find. Yep. Um, and they're all, they always introduce him as the father of remote viewing. And he's like, I'm not like he, he's very humble about yeah, it. Yeah. Um, he gives the credit to like other people that he worked with and stuff, he's but so he good. was responsible for like the scientific backing of it. That was his main thing. He didn't even like to know anything about what he was going to see because he wanted to be able to prove Mm -hmm. that he was legit. Right. Like, don't tell me. Yeah. No, I'm going to prove it to you. Wow. Um, So prior to Ingo's involvement, many studies had been done on the free response clairvoyance, which is what it was called previously. So he was not the one first one to ever do it. He was not the first one to figure it out, but he was studied extensively and he was responsible for like the scientific backing. Um, in 1975, uh, sorry, 1975 is when Ingo was approached by the CIA to remote view the moon. This is when he was asked to stand by the elephant at the museum of natural history in Washington, DC, and was taken to an undisclosed location to help with this project. The man who he received the call from and the man he was eventually led to by the twins to meet was Mr. named Mr. Axelrod, which is obviously a pseudonym. So Ingo didn't know where he was because he had the bag over his head, but he believed he was in Alaska when he had been taken to the secret location. Wow. Yeah, because I mean, if he can like read people's minds. Yeah. They wanted, I know, and I don't know Just think about it, like, just figure out where you are, just uh, by, like, thinking. I was thinking that when I started talking, but... But I'm sure it's different. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Why wouldn't he know where he was if that was the case? But... Maybe he wasn't trying to know. He might not be, yeah. Yeah. Um, So the CIA wanted Ingo's help on remote viewing the moon. He was paid $1,000 a day, which with inflation equals $5,700 a day. In 2023 money. Wow. So he was really nervous, he said in his book, because he did not want to fuck up. Uh-huh. Um, because he wanted this money. It was like a huge windfall for him. Oh, shit, yeah. So Ingo described needing coordinates to be able to accurately view things remotely and explained why having latitude and longitude worked for him. And it's because he believes... In a group mind, which is another word for collective conscious, and that he could access things that way because latitude and longitude coordinates are universally used on Earth, he could access the information that way. Um, Makes sense. The moon actually does have coordinates called selenographic, selenographic coordinates. Interestingly, Jupiter itself does not have coordinates. Hmm. But Ingo was able to triangulate its location using Jupiter's placement in the Zodiac and then using the location of the sun and using the location of Earth. Wow. Similarly, Ingo did not need the actual lunar coordinates to access the moon itself. To get to the moon, he needed to know what cycle the moon was in to determine its positioning from the sun. So he was able to like triangulate a location like a map in his head. To just to be able to get to the moon. Wow. Under the direction of Mr. Axelrod, 
Ingo was then given specific lunar coordinates to the area in which they wanted him to view. He was able to send his astral body or his consciousness, whatever you want to call it, to those exact coordinates on the moon, which was on the dark side of the moon. Wow. What he saw at first was a very fine powdery sand, which he could see piled in dune-like formations, which had made a pattern like trenches. Mm. He referred to the shiny sand as obsidian, which if you recall... I do recall that word. Van Tassel described... Of the obsidian. Uh, described the obsidian yep. dust, which the beings on the moon are mining. Right. And it makes sense that they would be in, in those kind of like mining formations or the, what, what, what is it called? Like fucking. Like they were like domes. Yeah. Like, oh, I was picturing like piles. Yeah. Of like, pile. yeah. They're piles. So and because they're digging from un, like yes. inside. Right? Yes. Yes. That's so cool. So part of the problem Ingo faced when remote viewing was his own ego or his thinking mind getting in the way. Yeah. If if something didn't make sense to him, he sometimes became so distracted and thought he was wrong, which like pulled him out of the experience um. of what he was actually trying to do, sort of like a psychic cognitive dissonance. For example, when he was asked to view the moon, he expected to see or feel not much of anything at all because we're told that the moon has no atmosphere, no wind, etc. Mm-hmm. So his first attempt, he had to take a coffee break and come back to it because what, he, like the first things he sees on yeah, the dark side of the moon wrong. He, is like, he thinks he's wrong. Yeah. So wow. he took a coffee break. When he came back, his astral body was situated in a crater and he noticed a green hazy light, which he followed and saw actual big green lights on towers, which he likened to football stadium lights. And I think he said they were like 50 something stories high or something, but he ha- didn't have anything really that he knew to reference because right. yeah. there was, he had a hard time like figuring it He's out. He's like, why the fuck would there be lights? He there? just kept, just, yeah, he kept asking these questions out loud. So remember, I'll, I'll get to it. Yeah. The air was dusty and he noticed again, the tread marks as if left by tires. He heard a low thumping sound. While he was in the out-of-body state, he was still conscious here on Earth and could communicate with whoever was in the room with him. Wow, that is freaking crazy. I thought he would be, like, not sleeping, but, like, like in a meditative state. Yeah, no. Wow. No. Alpha, not theta. That's right. Right? Crazy, huh? Wow. God, my brain is getting so big. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So he really thought he was wrong at first about what he was seeing and asked Mr. Axelrod if these were Soviet or U.S. built bases. And then it dawned Hmm. on him that we had barely gotten people to the moon at all and started, he started freaking the fuck out and basically having a panic attack of what he saw. So Ingo had always been a believer that the government, of course, knew more than they said they did, and he believed in UFO phenomena and of non-human intelligence. Yes. But seeing the proof firsthand sent him into like a full-blown blown panic attack. Wow. So this is where he realized that Mr. Axelrod and the twins most likely worked for some secret government project. He didn't know it was the CIA, and I couldn't quite make that link, but I think I think they were the CIA or some kind of dark like underground project. Mm -hmm. So that's when he realized that this is probably like a government project he was working on, um, which led him to believe that NASA probably already had this information because why else would they ask him to come in? Right. True. True. He started getting chills and crying at this incredible realization. Ingo asked Mr. Axelrod why they would possibly need a psychic's help if they already knew what was on the moon. Mm -hmm. Mr. Axelrod explains that the photos of the dark side of the moon that NASA took did show certain things, but everybody was arguing over what it was because it was all like up for interpretation and debate, the photos themselves. Yeah. They needed someone to remote view and provide an unbiased, as unbiased as they could be, account of what they saw. Okay. Ingo basically figured out that the Soviet Union was using very similar techniques using psychics and that the U.S. was worried that the Soviet Union would advance in this field faster than the U.S. would. After this, Ingo basically crashed and slept for six hours. And all he saw was the dust and the lights. So far. Yeah. So the next day, 
Mr. Axelrod provided different lunar coordinates, some of which Ingo didn't see much of anything. Other times he saw tons of other structures. He saw a lot of dome shapes, bridges, including a bridge that started but didn't end, kind of like a like a drop off, like a half hanging bridge to and this nowhere. Is still on the this moon? is on the moon. Okay. Um, towers, buildings, machinery, what? different colored lights, saucers with windows in hangars, and geometric There's shapes. There's the word hangers. Yeah, I know. We were searching know. for that. He also saw tubes, roads, and tractors along roads which belong to an entire mining operation. So at this point, I think I should make a t-shirt that says George Van Tassel said that because so many things he said are confirmed later by other sources. Write that down right now. George Van Tassel said that. But you never hear of it. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Nobody hears about George Van Tassel. Are you kidding me? Except unless you listen to this because I talk about him in every fucking episode and I don't mean to. Well, everything comes back to him. Everything comes back to that. Mm -hmm. It's so crazy. Yeah. So. Wow. So there's that. He even saw places he assumed to be homes, but he couldn't see into. He, uh, Ingo saw some beings digging into a hillside. They looked very similar to humans, but did not wear clothes and were all males. Ingo quickly began to realize that the beings knew he was there. They were pointing at him and talking to each other, which caused Ingo to psychically retreat. He told Axel this, and Axel told him to hurry up and come back. Jesus. This led Ingo to believe that these beings were psychic. He believed this to be a, quote, ripple in cross-dimensionality and that the beings felt or sensed a ripple and that's how, the thing, that's how they knew he was there. So, remember when we did the Hat Man episode and one of the theories was that Hat Man was someone else's astral projection? Yes. And I said I didn't buy that. I think it's yeah. bullshit. Yeah. Well, is it possible... <gasps> That oh that's God. maybe what they saw. Yeah. And that's Imagine. maybe that's what they that's what Hat Man is, either a human oh or alien God. astral projection. Imagine oh my God. And that your senses from taking too much Benadryl or yeah, from whatever are, are this situation is. Heightened. Yep. Wow, dude. You're able to see another dimension. When you were like, he's sitting in a crater, like on the moon, like the second day or whatever, or whatever it was, I was, I was picturing him, like his body. I know, I know it wasn't his physical body, but I'd like pictured his body sitting there. But imagine if there was like a fucking shadow sitting there. That's wild to it's think about. It's crazy to think about, right? And now that you're saying it in this episode, it, I'm putting it more together than I would have in the other. Yeah. Because before I was like, no yeah, way. Yeah. Why would it be that? Yeah. But now wow. it makes more sense. That is so crazy. So Hat Man could possibly be either a human or an alien astral projection. Regardless, the beings on the moon knew Ingo was there, whether telepathically or because they physically saw him with their eyes. A lot of... Other renowned remote viewers have come up with the same reports, even though we've been unable to scientifically prove what these psychics have seen on the moon is true, because even if we have, they're never going to tell us. No, of course not. Ingo also had an experience with a UFO while with Mr. Axelrod. Um, he w- he was again blindfolded, but felt as though he was in Alaska still at this point. He was in a very remote location. He saw a UFO come out of a lake and they tried to run away from it and it chased, excuse me, chased them. Wow. So after giving his assistance, Mr. Axelrod, he also told a very strange story in his book of an encounter with an extraterrestrial. While shopping for a dinner party at a grocery store, Indigo... Ingo noticed a scantily clad lady in the produce section. He thought she was so beautiful that he wanted to get close to her, but for some reason when he got up to her, he thought she was an alien. After checking out of the grocery store, he waited in his car to watch for her. When she came out, he could not see her eyes because she was wearing sunglasses and was also wearing sunglasses in the store, 
but mentions lots of times how sexy she was, which makes the story like just that well, little appara- bit of weird. Apparently, you don't need eyes to be sexy, you know. Well, she she probably had eyes, but they were she behind had eyes, sunglasses. But they were hidden. But apparently, there's a lot of. Well, other... he said she was very like voluptuous. Like uh-huh. he, the way he described it Curve. was like she had like huge boobs. Yeah, yeah, that's and all it takes. For, yeah, you know. Yeah. Or, so or apparently, some of my male friends just informed me that shoulders are sexy, and oh, I wow. I never thought of that. I was like really. <laughs> men think shoulders are sexy it's just i don't know but apparently remind me to tell you my myspace story about that <laughs> is it worthy to be on air no oh okay it's a little private about okay, my shoulders okay, okay. <laughs> lala was just reaching out for your shoulder when you were saying that She's trying to did scratch you see this? that oh you trying to scratch my chair all right so um yeah so he talks like a lot about how sexy she was um but yeah, and then he thought she was an alien. He received a call later that told him to wait in a train station. And I'm sorry if I got that wrong. I think it was a train station. It could have been like a bus terminal, something like that. Some busy building. Um, and he was approached by one of the twins who held out a cup as if pretending to ask for money. And on the cup was a message telling him to follow him. The twin went into a phone booth and, and laid the receiver down and walked away. So Ingo assumed he should answer the phone and that's what he did and on the phone was mr axelrod who said that they had to like make this secure connection and they had to do it in this way and mr axelrod questioned ingo repeatedly about his encounter with the et woman at the grocery store and made him promise not to tell anybody weird so that's like a weird like i have a hard time believing that's weird yeah that yeah but a lot of Ingo's writings discuss his belief of malicious extraterrestrials and like cyborg type things hmm. that are here on Earth and that their one true enemy is a psychic. In an article he wrote for a magazine, Ingo notes that nearly all alien encounters, abductions, and, and contacts involve telepathic communication. Just like we talked about in the last episode. Yep. And he wonders if the aliens themselves are in charge of humans' general lack of psychic ability or their belief in it. As we saw with the sheep goat studies, those that don't believe in ESP are automatically worse at it than those who do believe. Mm-hmm. And we can see the blatant destruction of belief in psychic phenomena throughout our history, from the forcing us into religion to the burning of witches at the stake. Yep. Yeah. There has always been a tearing down of those who haven't used their intuition and other psychical gifts. The very Bible is used against us in this way, that we should give all of our power to God or Jesus, and that these entities are somehow different from us ourselves. He believes he, he believed that non-human entities have been conditioning the human race for thousands of years. Yeah. But again, this story of the sexy E.T. in the grocery store is just weird, and I have a hard time believing it. But all of Ingo's personal connections, friends and family, as well as researchers and people he worked with on research projects, all described Ingo as being a very forthright person and was not one to embellish details. He was known by many and respected as very honest and genuine, both as a psychic and a person in general. He believed that there are many kinds of non-humans who have made their mark by telepathic communications with contactees, by abductions, and by accidental UFO crashes. Wow. Ingo was involved in Project ScanGate, which is a top-secret program from the 1970s to the 1990s. It was conducted by various U.S. government agencies, primarily the CIA and the Defense Intelligence Agency. Ingo was involved by both teaching remote viewing practices and also doing remote viewing for them himself. Scangate came came from the words scan and coordinate. This information is available on the FOIA archives on the CIA website. This project was eventually renamed in the 90s to Project Stargate, but in 1988, Ngo retired from actively being involved in remote viewing projects. In the 90s, Ingo was studied by neurologists who determined using an MRI that over his occipital lobes, there was a 7 hertz spike in slow wave activity activity where Ingo had, when Ingo had successful out-of-body experiences. They also determined that his, I'm sorry, parieto 
occipital region of the right hemisphere of his brain was structured differently. Okay, so that that's different. It is different. However, he was able to successfully teach other people how to remote view. So it's it's very possible it's to learn. Yeah, and the occipital uh, lobe is occipital. in the back of your brain. I think so. I believe with yeah. all of my brain. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I know I your ox, <gasps> occiput. Shit, my bad. Sorry is, about that. Your <sighs> occiput, I know, is on the bottom back of your yeah, head, like right? Yeah, like in the back. Yep, yeah, I right. don't think I have one because I can't wear like headbands. They just like fly <laughs> off my head. I don't have a occipital brain. I don't have an occipital lobe. I don't have the ox. What's it called? An occiput? I think it's called an occiput. Oh. Like the bone. Oh, the bone. Yes, 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 yes. I do have one. It's just it's not, small, not prominent. Because you have a small head. I do have a very tiny head. <laughs> We're going to say it every episode. Can we make it a point? Yeah, well, my head no is small and what. flat. And I always tell my mom it's because nobody loved me and I was laid on, on my head as a child. <laughs> I'm like repeatedly told about my flat, small head. I'm kidding. <laughs> I hope you know. You're not the only one who says it, though. I know. But I do really mean it when we take photos together, because it's obvious. How small my head is. Yeah. My little tiny you just pea make brain. my head look enormous. And I think my head's average. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I've never big. measured my head. We, we could find out. But anyway... Ango's wish was for people to penetrate, as he called it, these non-human life forms to understand exactly what they're doing and why. There is so much more to Ango in his work with different projects, particularly the ScanGate proje- project with the CIA and Ango's work with ufologists. His life's work spanned decades and is far too lengthy to cover everything in this episode. Wow, that's impressive. But he later went on to write books, his most famous being Penetration, written in 1998. That's the one that I read. Stop it. Yeah. Penetration. I know, it sounds did so sexual, Did you bring sexual, it to a but... doctor's office with reading it in the office? I did, but it was on that's my Kindle, hilarious. so... Oh, okay. She, can't, she didn't see. Oh, my um, goodness. But How weird, though, too, that, like... Well, I know it sounds like weird, but penetration no, would be the right word means. because he's talking about using right. like psi. Yeah, we just what did think he call it? Psi probes. Um, yeah, I think he called it psi probes, so he could like send yeah, yeah, yeah probes to people. Cool. Um, but it's just strange about the whole looking in his pants thing, and then we're talking about, you know. I know, and the sexy ET, and he wrote books about like sexual psychic stuff, and yeah. Maybe she was an alien, and that's why she was so mysterious Uh and sexy without knowing her, you know? He said that they're here. There's something. Yeah, yeah. So, Um, watch out. So, anyway, he read that he wrote a lot of books, his most famous being Penetration, which he wrote in 1988, excuse me, 1998, and that's where I got almost all of this information from. He also wrote some self-help books, including Everybody's Guide to Natural ESP, Unlocking the Extrasensory Power of Your Mind. Cool. He was also a very talented artist. He, I took this from his website. Um, Ingo was a self-taught artist who worked mostly in oil paintings. His artworks express his passion for exploring the mysteries of the universe and recapture his visions from leaving his body, remote viewing, and seeing auras. His works have been used in many publications shown at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum and are part of the permanent collections at the American Visionary Art Museum, the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art, one National Gay and Lesbian Archives at the USC Libraries and Edgar Edgar Casey's Association for Research and Enlightenment. Edgar Casey is uh, also a very famous psychic. He was known as the Sleeping Prophet, and he made a lot of uh, accurate predictions. Um, wow. So I actually really like his artwork. So I encourage our listeners to check it out if you're interested yeah. um they're very like mystical looking lots of colors mostly um, space themed yep. stars clouds swirls yeah, if this... you know me you know how much i love art because yeah. i'm a libra and yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, i really wanted to hear what his thoughts were about his art mm-hmm. like he oh, had cool. this one called the universal uh he had this one piece called universal intelligence mm-hmm. and it's space mm-hmm. with what looks like the sun in the background yep. and this in the like center a big circle 
Yeah. Is that the one I'm looking at right I, now, I think? I'm not sure. But in the center, there are like circles and there's an eye in the middle. Oh my God, dude, I have that that same one on my screen right now. Is that yeah. the one? No. Oh. No, that's not the one. Because that has an the, eye in the middle. Yeah, this one's called um, oh. Universal Intelligence. Oh, okay. But unfortunately, I couldn't find like really any information on his own words about his art i would have loved to hear it yeah um also just a side note police are currently using remote viewing in in missing person cases yeah but i I, you know and i know there's psychic detectives and stuff but like Mm -hmm. why the fuck can't somebody remote view where maura murray is why haven't we figured that out then yet i just thought of maura murray this morning yeah so weird dude like she popped into my head completely randomly Mm. so weird um, but I know I, I agree with you. Like, why can't, you know, if that's the case, like, why haven't we found a lot of bodies or people? I don't know. They say that we do. Um, but I, I don't, I didn't yeah. specifically go look like specifically what, but there's yeah. like very famous missing persons cases that have a lot of eyes on them. And you would think that yeah. they would have figured that out, but Finally, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Ingo Swan passed away on February 1st, 2019, um, in New York city. So just to end on a couple quotes from him, uh, he said, if one talks about things, people don't understand, they lose interest, which sounds like kind of blah on the surface. But, but if you really think, if you really deeply, think about that, mm-hmm. there's that. And then he also said, people fill, people fill in the unknown with what fits their known. Yeah. That makes sense. Like, that's what people want to do to be, it's comfortable. Yeah. You know? He also had a great quote um, on belief, beliefs that I posted on Facebook. Let me see if I can find it real quick. So here's a quote that I liked from him that I heard in an interview. He said, I don't deal with belief or disbelief. I just have devoted a lot of attention to the things that interest me. We have freedom in this country to pursue what interests us and to form opinions. If these areas don't interest other people, that's fine with me. We can't all be exactly alike. I like that. That's so true. I think he's great. Yeah. Who do you like better? Him or Van Tassel? Or, yeah, I was going to say, or Helen, because you love her too. That's Uh, tough. That is tough. That is tough. (laughs) Who is my favorite psychic? Yeah. (laughs) so many of them i know i know all right so that's it i i have no fan mail today unless you do i was just looking at our facebook messages actually but nobody's sending love so send us some love peeps yeah, you there's know? some fan mail from lala you ready say hi <laughs> i don't want to squeeze you say hi <laughs> she's making a mad face at the yeah no no little noises that's what we were waiting on say hi oh my god this person asked us to post pictures of our birthmarks did oh. you see that? No. Oh. But we can. Yeah, we should. See, people liked that episode where we where we were showing our birthmarks yeah. to each other. Those like little personal things. But yeah, no. That's about it. I got nothing. Nothing else. But that was a great episode. I'm very surprised the turn it took. Like when you first were telling me, I didn't expect it to go there, especially going to the fucking moon. Yeah. <sighs> that was right? really good. So thank you for that. You do you believe it? Absolutely, I fucking believe it. It's like absolutely. It's like the same thing as the the aerial school. It's like how many times are we going to hear the same yeah. thing until we believe it? Yes. Like he's not the only person that has said. Uh, it, it's of just a he's completely the different way of last, accessing right. the information. Yeah. And yeah. he just was involved in like government, you yep. know, without even really knowing it. Yep. And he was too good of a person to probably get like caught up in that on his own he had to be like sucked in mm-hmm. like that in that he really mysterious didn't, way he just really that whole to. like thing is super mysterious I know. yeah i know so. and he um he thought that the twins yeah were actually et's really and he willingly was just like oh i'll, I'll communicate with you like I guess. Yeah. I think he thought it after. I think he was under oh, the in assumption. retro he's probably looking yeah, back. Yeah. I think he thought that when they called him because mm-hmm. he had just talked to somebody about like the government probably is going to want to yeah. use him. Yep. And then and he, he put assumes, two and two and he was like, oh, he assumed literally it was the government. two and two. Yeah. I'm so, he assumed I'm such a fucking nerd. <laughs> he assumed Ugh. it was the government, but 
Yeah. I don't know if he ever found out what that was. I had, I had a real, cause I know he was involved in the CIA stuff with uh Scangate, but I had a really hard time, like trying to figure out if that was what he did on the moon, but it seemed like he never figured out who Mr. Axelrod was, hmm. um, or who he worked for. Yeah. Um, so, but he got paid. So that's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, that, I really liked that. That was awesome. Something okay, I've never heard of. Yeah. And Finally. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's a lot of them I'm I'm not aware there's of. There's a lot that I haven't heard of, yeah. which is... It's overwhelming almost. It is, but it's so fun because like, yeah. you always have something to, there is. to talk just about. There is. There's so many topics that we will cover. Yeah, and time. sometimes like... Like we've talked about, like we start getting into one and we're like, mm-hmm. oh, this is boring. That happens a lot yeah. lately to me. And yeah. and not even just that it's boring, either that it's like not factual or it's like, sometimes it's like, why do people go on with this big thing and then at the end be like, and it wasn't real. Like, I know. fuck you. I know. You just wasted an hour of my time. I know. You know, I want to just wash my dis- dis- dishes and I want to fucking absorb listen. Absorb real yes, information. Yes, and I want to <laughs> absorb, exactly, correct factual <laughs> information. And you're telling me this whole fucking story and I'm so into it. I'm like, I can't wait. Yeah. And then right at the end, well, it was a hoax. Yeah. It was fake. Like That's why off. I liked Mel's Hole because yeah. we don't know if it was a hoax or not. Yeah, that's true. It probably was, but we don't yeah. know. Yeah, I like that. Anything that's like unknown to us is Anything mysterious. Is so, yes, exactly. And I know you don't like to, or you don't want to cover like true crime things, and I understand why. But I do think some cases yeah. are warranted because There's a they're few. like some, yeah. like, like Mara Mori. That's yeah. a good example. Yeah. Like, we have to respectfully present it, but like, and of course, we always mean to be respectful. We don't mean to be disrespectful for the dead or the missing yeah but, um but yeah that's there's why, some like, cases that I are don't, just like mind-blowingly weird that's why i don't like covering them like when we talked about brian schaefer like people yeah. were like you are so disrespectful like to who i know to who to his brother you think his brother like and and i mean not to not for nothing but we hadn't even began talking about him yet and like I mean, once we did, we weren't right. joking right. off anymore. Right, right. You know, so come on, people, be easy, get it together. Yeah, get a Just hold of yourself. Up, smoke, a, smoke a joint. <laughs> you know, stop being so like offended over everything. Yes, that's another thing we can yeah. fucking talk about. Like, come on, but. Yeah. All right. But anyway, that well, was fun. That was <laughs> that's fun. it, and that's all. Yes. So you close. Uh, we will see you again next week. Stay, Stay mysterious. mysterious. Make it mysterious! Podcast. <laughs>